We'll introduce the speakers, starting with Dr. Vip Dev, who is a plastic and general surgeon. He is the founder of a large pre-ACO clinical integration program, where he's a member of the Board of Managers and is also uh, the chairman of the Board of Managers and a chairman of the Quality Committee. I am Jeff Lehrman. I'm a podiatrist and a former medical director at my wound healing center in hyperbaric medicine, and I'm a certified professional coder, and Dr. John Sammies, who has a specialty in both infectious disease and internal medicine. He is his hospitalist's epidemiologist, and he's also the medical director at his wound care center. So we'll start with Dr. Dev. Please welcome Dr. Dev. Good morning, everyone. Um, Jeff, thank you very much. Um, So, Jeff, that was a great introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, He left out one important fact, and that is I'm a recovering plastic surgeon. (laughs) And um, I I had the privilege of training in San Antonio, Texas, in plastic surgery. And um, I see one of plastic surgery colleague back there, I think, yeah. And uh, he doesn't remember, but I met him so many years ago. Um, and I'm glad to see another plastic surgeon at a wound care conference, right? What I was taught in plastic surgery is we all make wounds for a living, right? And so uh, I I think now after so many years, I actually believe it to be true. And uh, so thank you for being here with us this morning. Uh, My disclosures, other than the fact that I'm a recovering plastic surgeon, is uh, I uh, work very closely with Dignity Health, now Common Spirit. Um... It's just one of those things that's going on in our society now, right? Everyone's merging with everyone. So I don't know who else is going to merge tomorrow, but we'll find out, I'm sure. And then um, I work with Restorix at one of the wound care centers that works with Dignity Health in California. Uh, Learning objectives. Uh, We're going to outline the process and criteria required for CMS. Transitional pass-through. That's my task. Uh, And then... Uh, My colleagues here are going to investigate the unique nuances of reimbursements for skin substitutes. Oh, uh, evaluation code, please fill that out for us. That would be helpful. Um, These are my roles currently. You know, I found this on the Internet, and uh, as I was preparing for this, I thought, what what is so confusing? What is it? You know, and I remember the matrix, and I remembered all these things, and I thought, well, no one really knows what's going on at any given day. Things can change any time, and it's like this room. You know, you don't know what door to go in, and there's a pile of numbers all around you, and you kind of decipher what you want. But the answer's in here somewhere. You just got to find someone that knows, or at least can lead you through the right door. So here's another thing I found, and this is interesting. Look, it says you can keep track of some very complex storylines, right? But let me read this to you. It says, okay, so that's Shannon. She and Vicky used to be friends until Shannon found out that Vicky's ex-boyfriend was lying about cancer. Vicky and Shannon had a falling out, so Vicky started spreading rumors about Shannon's husband, so Shannon gained a lot of weight and blamed it on Vicky. I, I don't know what that has to do with anything. I don't even know what that has to do with coding or pass-through. But that's kind of like what this is about, right? So hopefully at the end of this, you'll have somewhat of a better understanding of what this pass-through is, what happens, you know. I, I don't want to put smoke and mirrors in front of you and say, and hey, by the way, that's pass-through. But let's go through it together, and hopefully we'll learn about the status through solid evidence that I can show you. Now, these are the different types of storylines that you're going to get. You know, it's going to be from the internet. You're going to get it from reps. You're going to get phone calls. You're going to get material. This is just an example, you know, but really we're going to focus on the conversation in the middle. That's what we really care about. So I figured I can't even begin to start to explain what CMS is and all these other things that go on, but I figured let's start with some acronyms that are constantly being used, and let's see if we can at least make them simple for us, right? So CMS, Centers for Medicaid and Medi- Medicare and Medicaid Services, ASP, you're going to hear that. That's average sales price. OPPS, Outpatient Prospective Payment System. 340B, that's a really interesting one. You, any, everyone familiar with 340B? If you're not, it's okay, because you know what? I didn't know about it either for a long time, but now I do. Medi-Medi, 
Medicare, Medicaid, right? That's data matching. CR means continuing resolution. PBM is a pharmacy benefit manager, right? What does that have to do with anything? We're at wound care, right? What is pharmacy benefit manager? Well, you know, at our hospital, we went from, from like having silvadine that we can just put on 10, 15 years ago to silvadine that comes in little vials that's in a, in, in a stupid little machine that you have to put a thumbprint on. And it doesn't respond, so someone gets mad, and then they say, what's that patient's name? And, you know, this is where we are. So, I mean, that, that's, that's what they do, right? And then we got to look at this, 6%. I'm going to get to explaining all this to you. I just want to let you know, so before, when I throw these numbers out there, you know what we're doing. 6% is actually a benefit, okay? So when I say 6%, when I'm talking to you, 6% is a benefit. When I use 22.5%. That's going to be a penalty in the eyes of some folks, okay, especially the 340B folks. When I say Part A, that's inpatient hospital coverage. Everyone knows that. When I say Part B, I mean outpatient medical coverage. Part C is A plus B or an alternative or an advantage plan, Medicare plan, okay, which, by the way, sometimes isn't necessarily an advantage. Right. <laughs> Part D is prescription drug coverage. All right, now, here we go. Medicare payment policy is almost always complicated. I want everyone to understand that, please. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm gonna make it easy for you because I don't think it's easy. I don't think it was meant to be easy. It's complicated. This started in the mid-1980s. I'm sure you can all remember the mid-1980s. The music was great, right? No? Okay. Uh, Mid-1980s hospitals were paid on reasonable cost unreasonable charges, okay? So what that meant is the hospitals would treat a patient and they would say, hey, you know what? This, this treatment costs us $10,000. Medicare would say, you know what? That's, that's about right. Why don't we pay you $9,800? would say, yeah, that sounds good, okay? That's reasonable, okay? Cost funding, Medicare was going to pay their fair share. So again, like I said, if it was $10,000, Medicare would say, listen, we can't afford $10,000, but we can afford $9,800. Is that good? Right? And they'd say, yeah. Let me give you a perspective of where I was when I agreed to give this presentation. Right? I said, yeah, that sounds really good. Just like everything, right? I, most of us that are surgeons say yes to everything because we want it. We want to be there. The problem is, is we say yes and we realize like, oh damn, how am I gonna work this out, right? So I thought about this, I thought, you know, this is complicated. So what I did was I started calling and I started asking some friends and so on, and I found, I found a guy in Washington, D.C. who actually knew about some of this. And even he said, hey, Vip, this is gonna get complicated. And we had, you know, we had a very nice long phone interview. I actually interviewed someone in Washington, D.C. that agreed to the interview, by the way. And he agreed for me to give you his name. Dr. Thomas Gustafson. You guys should read about him. Incredibly good dude. He's a really good guy. Gave some great information. And then, of course, I had to do the rest of the work myself. But I was hoping he was going to just do it all for me. That didn't work out. But... Even he thinks this is complicated. And by the way, he's been doing policy work in the government for CMS and others for more than 20 years, just to give you an idea. So a lot of this information comes directly from a great source. The hospital, which meant that if the hospital spent more, Medicare pay, paid more for their share. So what do you think is going to happen in our country? When the hospital spends more and Medicare says, hey, if you spend more, we'll give you your fair share. What do you think is going to happen? in the 80s, when life was good, medicine was great, right? We were all taking vacations. I mean, hospitals got paid a lot of money if they spent more. So that's what they did. They actually started spending a lot of money. In 1986 was the first innovation in patient prospective payments. Remember, I gave you the OPPS, the outpatient I didn't give you the inpatient. This was the first innovation, the inpatient payments based on D3. 
DRGs, right? So you have an ulcer, the cubitus ulcer stage four, DRG. How much you're gonna spend on taking care of that patient? They're gonna pay you your full amount or close to it. So there was no advantage for the hospitals to spend more. I apologize for the misspell there. The length of stay or outpatient, right? So basically if the patient stayed in for three weeks, if the patient was gonna be an outpatient, they kept it inpatient, Charges got to go up, right? No incentive. So then Medicare said, you know what we need to do? We need to rethink this whole process. We need to gain some control. We need to figure out how we're going to control this. It's getting out of, out of hand. So Medicare said, you know what? We're going to do this. We're not going to give you more because you spend more anymore in the 90s. So the 80s went by fast. In the 90s, the mid-90s, Congress told CMS, Congress, this was a Congress decision. They told CMS, hey, you guys need to figure out another way because the 80s killed us. We don't really have that much money anymore in this program, so we need to figure out another way. So they wanted the OPPS. Remember, the outpatient services, right? Can you believe it? Congress told CMS, I think roughly around the mid-90s, the problem is, is the year 2000 came. Remember what happened in the year 2000? Computer shut down, the internet stopped, or the internet was just going, it kind of stopped, it got delayed. So Y2K hit, therefore, the implementation of the OPPS program got delayed because of Y2K. CMS didn't factor in for Y2K, so it was delayed. So the incentives were good, but they just weren't in good control. So in other words, when the hospital spent more, Medicare paid more, but Medicare didn't look at, hey, you know, we have an increased length of stay. Maybe we should control that. So there was lots of innovation. So CMS basically told industry, said, you know, can you help us treat patients better? Or can you help us get them out? Can you help us solve a surgical problem? Can you help us solve this issue with wounds or, you know, all this chronic, uh, all, all these decubitus ulcers and stuff that we see? Can you help us with this? So then lots of innovation started picking up. The problem is, is with all this innovation, no one had payment rates. So if a company said, hey, you know, this little Band-Aid seems like it's maybe 5,000, they'd say, oh, okay. It's a really new Band-Aid, huh? Right? <laughs> it's new, isn't it? Right? You can wink, wink, it's new. So pay more. The problem is, that, so everyone aware how CMS works, they look at two years previous. Did you know that? Did you all know that? They look at a two-year previous time frame to decide on what they're going to do now. So we're in 2019. Therefore, the data that's used now came from 2017. So if you're a company and you have an innovative product in 2018, what price do you put on it? You don't know because it's not 2020. Does that make sense? Right? It's just as confusing, you know, it's, it, it's kind of like that never-ending story thing, you know, the guy with the coconuts and he changes it and he kind of like, you know, you must be a far superior human being. But that's what this is, you know, you, you, you've, you've got to, it, it's crazy, but you have to think about the time frames and that's how CMS works, okay? So what they said is, we're going to look at the way we look at practices. Can you believe they actually use doctors? CMS was going to use doctors' practices to help industry figure out pricing. And when they look at doctors' practices, they call it micro-costing. So for all you doctors out there think that you don't get paid enough, they call you micro-costing. Think about that, micro-costing. So they look at, and what that is, is that's a breakdown of every little product used. That makes sense, doesn't it? So someone actually does that. They look at every little piece of product used to take care of so hospitals looked at the end of the year and what was spent for the year. So hospitals literally broke down every little piece of thing that they used, and they, at the end of the year, they had a certain price. And that's what data CMS looked at. CMS looked at the charges, and they looked at it procedure by procedure. Example, if the device went out today, we're not in 2018, 
the hospital couldn't afford it. So in other words, if your product came out in 2018 and you went to the physician and said, hey, we got a great product, you need to use it. Problem is, if the product price was too high, the hospital couldn't afford it, so you weren't gonna get to use that product in 2018. So it's a good product, you just didn't have access. Now, there's a two payment system out there. I'll explain this to you. New technology, APC for a procedure, and so this is a new product that's in the works right now. It's an AV fistula device without an open procedure. We're all in wound care, so you know that we have renal patients, right? So think about this, an AV fistula without an open procedure. Can you imagine what a cool product? Like for us as surgeons, we can actually do surgery on somebody that's in renal failure and get them dialyzed pretty quickly. It's a new tech APC status, that's what they get for this. The device is part of a procedure. So it is part of the AV fistula procedure. That is different than what we're talking about when we say skin substitutes. That's a different payment system. That's the new technology, right? Because it's part of a surgical procedure. When we talk about pass-through for drugs and devices, that's a whole different program. That's the program that I told you about that goes back to Congress telling CMS to come up with a new payment system for the product because it's not part of a procedure. Am I confusing you now? Okay. So that rule went out in 1997, and the reason why it got delayed is because of Y2K for products, for innovative products. So what happened? Industry panicked in the, in, in the 1990s. They really panicked about what to do. They got together, and they lobbied Congress. And... This group called AdvaMed and other associations got together and said, hey, we really got to figure out this whole pricing model. Something's got something's to be right. And remember, all this happened, by the way, before Part D came along. Remember, Part D is the outpatient drug, right? Device manufacturers were also behind a lot of this. They had to figure out how they were going to get paid for their products. Pharmaceutical, you know, it's, it's a well-known fact that pharmacy spelled, uh, pharmaceutical companies spend billions to get products to the market. Device manufacturers spend more than their fair share to get products to the market. They have to make it up somehow. Here's the mechanism. So basically, here's now the process before we see it in our wound care centers. So the companies are bound to apply basically an application. It's, uh, I think, about a 16-page application, roughly, somewhere there, about there. Um, the application is received at CMS. It's, a, it's every quarter. So every quarter, they receive the applications, they review it, and then the next quarter, they either approve it or, or not. The deadline is four months before each quarter. So like I said, every quarter is another deadline. Requires about 10 hours of staff time of just filling out all the necessary paperwork. It's a straightforward application. You can go online and print it out. A consultant, I put a question mark there. You know, um, we're on the wound care business, right? There's a consultant for everything. I don't know if you really need a consultant. And I can tell you is uh, after speaking to a consultant, the truth is, is you can probably do it without one. Drugs are easier than devices. Believe it or not, can you believe drugs are easier to go through the pass-through than devices are to go through the pass-through? There's two standards to pass the drugs, and one of them is a new drug application. Pretty straightforward. The standards. So these are the three standards that have to happen for a pass-through device. It has to be new. It has to be significantly expensive relative to the APC in which it is being used. Okay, so in other words, if you have a bunch of other products out there, yours can't be just a dollar more. Or it can't be, you can't go and say, hey, by the way, we're the same cost as the other ones. You need to be significantly more expensive. Kind of strange, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. This poor lady is so confused, I'm so sorry. But I, I didn't make the rule, okay? 
substantial clinical improvement with data outcomes. You have to show that. That we all know, data outcomes, right? We like that, we wanna see that. The part that I have a problem with is the second part, but you know what? If you really, really understand it like I do now, it makes sense. It has to be significantly more expensive for them to give you that pass-through status. So here are the nuances. CMS can reduce payments for drugs and devices. They can do that. They have the ability to do that, and they can do that, as we all know. If the new product is in addition to a treatment, that matters. In other words, say, for example, you're doing a certain procedure, and this product is going to add to the treatment of that. That's a good substitute. If the substitute product you didn't get as much and has to get new to get the new incentive. What does that mean? Okay, so let's just say I have, and I'm gonna give you an example, I have a pacemaker. Well, the pacemaker is gonna get paid so much, but if I have a pacemaker and a defibrillator with that pacemaker, that's a new product, right? I can't have a pacemaker that has six leads versus four, because that's still a pacemaker. But if I have a pacemaker with the defibrillator in it, that's a new product. So there's my example, right? I show a bunch of dollar signs. So that extra cost, right, that I put on there, that's your pass-through. Right? Everyone with me so far? The pass-through with the new product? The price has nothing to do with what the manufacturer sets. Are we okay with that statement? Everyone, everyone on the same page with that now? The manufacturer doesn't get to set that. They can suggest it, okay, but they can't necessarily do it. What hospital charges the patient is another interesting part of this because the hospital charges the patient X amount of dollars. That has nothing to do with it either. Smart hospitals, what they will do, is they'll mark up to recover from Medicare sometimes. A lot of the times what they'll do is they'll have a factor, and you know every hospital's kind of different, unless now you're, all the systems are coming together, so they have very similar pricing that they put together. But that's what, that's what they do. And by the way, you know this whole transparency thing out? Hospitals are being transparent with their costs, or I'm sorry, with their charges. So yeah, I mean, we're, we all know hospitals can charge. So be transparent with the, car, with the charges, it's totally fine but they all have to be very similar, right? Um, now, I promise you the 622.5, right? So drug payment rate is based on ASP methodology, average sale price methodology. Here's the way it works. It's ASP plus 6%. So in other words, the average sale price that is set plus 6% is what the hospital or the facility will get, will, will get to charge and get paid on. They'll get 6% on a volume basis. That's the way drugs are. It's on a volume basis. So in other words, if you used, it's not like, oh, well, we use two vials. That's not it. It's how much volume did you use of that? So everyone, you know, in the OR, what they have us do is they say, oh, well, doctor, how much did you inject of the lidocaine? You can't just say, oh, I just used a whole bottle. How many cc's did you use? That's why they ask you that, right? Or if you have a certain size wound, how much of the product did you use on there, right? So again, it's, CMS wants to know, like, what, what exactly are we doing down to that part, right? So the average sale price for them is empirically derived. So it's not, again, you know, we, we think, like, someone's thinking about this, some mad scientist is really thinking about all this. Sometimes it's not. It, it's really not. It, it's pretty straightforward for them. So here it is. ASP plus 6% is shaded for the 340B hospitals. The 340B hospitals... Uh, as a general uh, statement, are usually inner city hospitals. Okay? Uh, the 340B filed suit against CMS for the rollback because they got penalized 22.5%. So when they used the drug, they got 6%, and then in the 340Bs, when they were, pa when they were outside of the pass-through st status, they actually took away 22.5%. And the reason why they did that is because they actually charged 50% more. You get it? So it's like the going out of business sale. They're not really going out of business, but you know, that, that's what they did. 
340B was in case in the ACA. That's how it started, 340Bs. And then the ruling allows purchase to discount Medicaid rate. During the pass-through, the 340Bs get ASP plus 6%. How am I doing on time? A few more? Okay. All right. The new technology, but then reapplied through the product without the nuances of the novelty. And the advantages of Part B was because the Medicare used it for the outpatients. Now, here are the examples. Biosimilars. Just as an overview, we're not talking about the biosimilars, but the drugs all get passed through very quickly. For the devices, these are examples of devices, catheters, balloons, pacemakers, and then all kinds of biologic tissues. Epic disasters. You know, almost no one fails through the pass-through status. You get it, and then you lose it. You don't always get it back. What is it? This is a brief, this is one of those slides that you can take through and just say, hey, what is, what is the pass-through status? It's a payment system, and it's used for encouragement. How does it work? It involves paperwork. It's just simple little things. What, why do we have to do it? To develop new technology. That was the impetus of, of the pass-through status. When is it utilized? CMS wants it utilized as much as you possibly can, as long as it's new and innovative. And it costs more. Risk benefits, just like everything in healthcare, there's a cost. And then the process was based on good intent. Here's the future. The pass-through is not going away. It's going to encourage more development. We're going to have pricing in there. I think there's going to be bundling coming down the pike, by the way, as we get more into this. And I think pass-through is going to be part of it. And then I think CMS is going to do more population management when they do more pass-through status. This is just a summary of what the CMS is doing currently. Uh, look at this. I think they're gonna, they might go to five-year pass-through status instead of the two- to three-year that they have now. And they always look at average consumption of resources. And I think we at Wound Care need to get on that bandwagon of looking at resources utilized if we want to continue using new and innovative products. These are my opinions. They may matter to you, but CMS wants to see progress. I think the last statement is probably where I am. Outcomes do matter. So if you have a product out there with pass-through status, I think outcomes are going to matter. Thank you. Sorry, Jeff. Sorry, bud. pieces of it. Sorry. So that brings us to where we are today. Sorry, the batteries fell out of the clicker here. That brings us to where we are today. And that evolution brings us to our current day model. And we're going to talk about how to code for these things today and how to navigate, right? That was the title of our session here, how to navigate. And what does that really mean? Navigate, I think, means how to understand the system so we can get our patients what they need and we can get paid. So my goal is that 13 minutes from now, you know exactly how to code for these products without any guessing and without any ambiguity. And we'll hit some navigation along the way. The first thing we need to know is that there are two completely separate games, two different systems depending on where the product is being applied. There's one game in the private office setting, and there's a different, totally different game in the hospital, outpatient, and ambulatory surgery center settings. Those are the same. Hospital, outpatient, ASC, we're playing the same game, playing by the same rules. In the private office setting, we buy the product. It lives on the shelf or in the freezer or gets delivered that morning or whatever, and we apply it and we code for the application, and separately, in addition to the application, we code for the product. That's the Q code. So private office, we buy it, we put it on, we code for the application, and we code for the product. And what most of you probably already know is you code for the product by the number of units of the product that you apply. So in the office setting, the larger the size, the more the profits are, the smaller, the less you make. 
So I said in the beginning, this starts to be a situation where if you have the option and if your patients are comfortable with it and you are able to, it might be something where you might want to do one type of graft in the office and a different type of graft or size of graft in the hospital outpatient or ASC setting. So in the office, you code for the application and for the product. Totally different system. Hospital outpatient ASC where we have one of three situations, depending on the product. It's either the low-cost bundle, the high-cost bundle, or pass-through, which Dr. Dev told us about. Every single one of these products, and there's a million of them, right? Every one of them, when it comes to hospital outpatient or ASC, gets put into either the low-cost bundle or the high-cost bundle, except for one. There's one that has passed through status in the hospital, outpatient, and ASC setting. And that's really important because that one product is phenomenal clinically, but also can allow us to achieve ridiculous profits in the hospital, outpatient, and ambulatory surgery center settings. So we'll look at low-cost bundle and high-cost bundle. For some reason in our world, this has become low-bucket and high-bucket. How did that happen? And why is it that way across the whole country? And we all know what each other's talking about when we say that. that there's nothing to that. That's not a thing. The true term is low cost bundle or high cost bundle. We'll call it buckets because somehow that's what everybody says. So every product gets put in one or the other except for one, which is passed through. And the way the bundle works is the low cost bundle is assigned a dollar value. And the high cost bundle is assigned a dollar value. Again, this is just hospital outpatient and ASC. If you put on a high cost bundle product, you get paid one number. And the crazy part is that this is regardless of size. So let's pick high cost bundle as an example. The national average is $1,548. Yours will be different by... 10 to $20 up or down, maybe $100 up or down, depending on your area and the wage index of where you are. Normally, more highly populated areas, it's over 1548. More rural areas, it's under 1548. But it's in the ballpark. And the crazy thing, again, is that it's by product name, not size or cost. So if product X gets put into the high bundle and we put on product X... In the hospital outpatient or ASC setting, we get 1548. And the crazy thing is if product X is a, you use the 12 millimeter disc version of product X and it costs 400 bucks, we get 1548. If we use a big giant piece of product X that costs $1,800 to bring in because it's big, we get 1548. So the system is weird, but you can see how you can, first is what's important for the, most important for the patient, right? But once that decision is made, now you can start to see how you might choose to navigate this craziness. And I'll be very honest, at my wound care center that I ran, we wanted pass-through first, because pass-through hospital outpatient ASC, for the one product that has pass-through, we get to code for application and the product. And again, the bigger you go, the higher the profits are. When it comes to the high cost bundle products, of course, we need a size that will cover what the patient needs. But if it's all paying the same and it's a good quality product, then the smallest size that will cover the size of the patient's ulcer is going to be the one that's most profitable in the high cost bundle. So I hope that's a bit of navigation. Now we can get into choosing the code. And if you've looked in your book ahead, or you already know, there's a bunch of these, right? So the goal here is to provide some clarity. First question when choosing the code is where are we applying it? That's easy, right? So there's one set of codes if it's trunk, arms, or legs. If it's anything other than trunk, arms, or legs, it's the other set of codes. So we don't even have to read all those options because the first one's easier, trunk, arm, or leg. 
An arm or leg does not include hands or feet, right? That's in the other category. So if it's trunk, arms, or legs, we're going to choose from this set of CPT codes, and we'll go through them. If it's anything other than trunk, arms, or legs, we're going to choose from this set of CPT codes. So now let's get into the coding. Once we've decided if it's trunk, arms, or legs, or the others, the next question is, what is the total surface area of the wounds to be treated? What's the total surface area? Is it over 100 square centimeters or under, under 100 square centimeters? So which body part? That's easy. And then total surface area to be treated, is it over 100 or under 100? That's easy also. So if it is trunk, arms, or legs, and it's under 100, we start here with 15271. Now that's all easy. This is where it starts to get weird. But if you hang in there, it's not that complicated. It's just weird, but not difficult, just weird. So if the total is 100 or under, sorry, if the total is under 100 and it's trunk, arm, and legs, we start here. But this code only gets us the first 25 square centimeters. So if it's trunk, arm, or legs, it's under 100, and it's 25 or less, we're done. This is it. This gets us the first 25 square centimeters. But if it's trunk, arm, or leg, and it's under 100, we start here, that's cool, but it only gets us the first 25. So if we go over 25 square centimeters, we need an add-on code for each additional 25 square centimeters. So if it's trunk, arm, or leg, and it's under 100, we start with 15271. That gets us up to the first 25 square centimeters treated. And if we go over 25, now we need an add-on code for each additional chunk of 25 square centimeters. And the number of units of the add-on code correlates with how many additional chunks of 25 square centimeters we treat. So I think the best way to do this is with an example. So let's say it's a leg ulcer, and it's 78 square centimeters. We do length times width, we come out with 78 square centimeters. So it's trunk, arm, or leg, so we know where we're starting. The total is under 100. We start with 15271. But that only gets us the first 25. We need to get to 78. So 15271 gets us 25. Our first unit of 15272 gets us to 50. Our second unit of 15272 gets us to 75. We're still not there. The third unit gets us over 75 and gets us to 78. That's proper coding. Hopefully anybody that's doing coding knows that add-on codes, by definition, do not take 59, 51, or X modifiers. No 59, no 51, no Xs on add-on codes. If you don't know what X is, ask during the Q&A session because it's important. <coughs> Where people get into trouble with this is they'll do 78 and they'll code 15271 times four units. That's wrong. Some people also skip the 15271 and just jump and do the add-on code only. That's wrong also. You always have to have the first one. Always to get the first 25 and then the add-on code goes over. If it's trunk, arm, or leg, and the total is over 100 square centimeters, we start here. And now it's the same concept. I think we can go faster. If it's trunk, arm, or legs, we start here. This gets us the first 100. And then there is an add-on code for each additional 100. So the 15273 would get us the first 100. If we go over 100, we need the add-on code for each additional chunk of 100 square centimeters. And then the same deal applies for the other body parts. Anything other than trunk, arm, or leg, and I think a lot of us are doing this on feet, right? Anything other than trunk, arm, or leg, we have a different set of codes with the exact same rules. So if it's a body part other than trunk, arm, or leg, is it over 100 or under 100? If it is under a total of 100, we start here with 15275, but just like trunk, arm, or leg, that only gets us 
the first 25 square centimeters. If it's a total of under 100, but we go over 25, then we need an add-on code for each additional chunk of 25. And we have the same deal for body parts other than trunk, arm, or leg, where it's over 100. Where 15277, this probably is less frequent, right? Especially because we're doing a lot of this on foot. That's a really big foot ulcer, but it could happen. One code for the first 100, add-on code for each additional. I'm going more quickly now because it's just the same concept repeated. So let's summarize this. If it's trunk, armor, legs, we start over on our left. Then we ask, is the total less than 100 or greater than 100? If it's less than 100, we use those codes. 15271 for the first 25, 15272 for each additional 25. If it's greater than or equal to 100, we go here. If it's any other body part, we start with those codes. If it's less than 100, we start here. If it's greater than or equal to 100, we start here. And what we've created here is the worst PowerPoint slide <laughs> in the history of PowerPoint presentations. And studying this stuff, we violated every single rule that applies to creating PowerPoints. But I hope that by gradually building, it makes sense. And I thought this brought everything together in what could be a tricky situation. So I acknowledge it's a crummy slide. But hopefully by building, it made sense. And I know that one's not in your packets. I came up with that idea later. But all the concepts are. There are seven Medicare contractors in the country. You should know who your Medicare contractor is. If you don't know what I'm talking about when I say Medicare contractor, find me at some point today and please ask. Four of them have active local coverage determinations or local coverage articles regarding skin substitute use. Three of them have retired policies. Most of them require the use of a KX modifier on both the application and on the product. The KX modifier is normally reserved for weird things or things that have more documentation requirements like DME stuff. Most of them require the KX on both the application and on the product. The product that you're using must have a Q code unless you want to do it for free. It's got to have a Q code. If it doesn't have a Q code, nobody's getting paid. So some of these newer ones where they show up and they're all excited about their new product, my first question is, do you have a code? Because if it doesn't have a Q code, we got a problem. So it must have a code. When you apply this in the office, we always had to document waste. But now we have to code waste. This was brand new. January 1, 2018, and a lot of people still haven't gotten the message. And a lot of people are still doing it wrong. And there's a reason you're getting away with it if you're doing it wrong, which we can explain if we have time. But the bottom line is, this is now the rule. We always had to document waste. Now we have to code waste. So in the office, when you apply this, the proper coding is the application code first, right? The 1527 codes that we just went through. And then the product code twice on line two and on line three. So line two is the product code, the Q code, with the number of units used, JC modifier. Line three is the same product code again, the same Q code repeated with the number of units wasted with a JW modifier. If line two is how many units we used and line three is how many units we wasted, when we add them together, we get the total number of units that came out of the box. So I think the best way to do this is via example. Let's say we have a five square centimeter foot ulcer. We're gonna put a skin substitute product on. The closest we can come is six. They want us to use sizes that are appropriate for the size of the ulcer. Six is close enough. It's okay to go over a little. First is the application code. So what body part is it? It's not trunk, arm, or leg. Right? It's foot, so we're starting over at the other side. Is it less than or over 100 square centimeters? It's five, so it's less. 15275 gets us there. We're not going over 25 square centimeters, so we're done. 15275. But then we have our product code. I just picked one. Q4160. The ulcer's five. The product is six. We covered it. We didn't overlap. We trimmed away the edges, so we used five and wasted one. Now, Today, 
They pay both lines. Dr. Dev shared some opinions. I'm going to share my own conspiracy theory, which is based on nothing. I have no inside information. This isn't HMP's opinion. This isn't organogenesis opinion. This is my own thing. Why are they making us do this? I think somebody somewhere figured out that they were paying for 38 square centimeters of product to cover plantar sub-1 ulcers, which are little, right? Our diabetic foot ulcers, sub-1, sub-5, plantar heel, they're small. And I think somebody figured out what's going on here. So they made us document the waste for a long time, but now they're making us feed them this information. So once again, they're using us. Now I'm going to get upset. They're <laughs> using us as their own statisticians, but we're telling them what we're throwing in the garbage, and I am concerned that the day is coming where they're going to only pay for what was used. And to be fair, I certainly don't side with them. If I was the one writing the checks, I wouldn't want to pay for what went in the garbage, which is, I think, one of the reasons why it's important to have size options. So just something to think about. In the hospital outpatient department slash ASC, we talked about high bundle, low bundle, or pass-through. If it's pass-through, you get to code for the application, just the way we described, and the product. If you're in hospital outpatient or ASC, the application is bundled. And the high cost bundle gives you that 1548 adjusted based on wage index. And the coding is exactly the same as we just went through. That's easy. So the facility submits the code just the way I explained. If it's low bundle, it's almost the same. If it's low cost bundle, it's almost identical. It's the same breakdown of the body parts. It's the same breakdown of over 100, under 100, and all that, except the first character of one gets replaced with the letter C. If you're in a facility, you already know this. If you're putting on low-cost products, the coding is the same, except the first character of one gets replaced with a C, and then these look exactly the same with the body part and the add-on codes and under 100, over 100, except you change that first character of one to a C. I'm going to blow through these. It's all the same deal. You just switch it to a C. Dr. Sammies is going to take us the rest of the way with more uh, discussion on navigation, and he's going to conclude with something very important, what is very likely to be a radical change coming to our game in less than eight months. Okay. Well, obviously we're going to try and avoid denials. That's probably one of our big things. Um, and in doing that, we're going to have to implement some comprehensive controls in our clinics. And hopefully that will end up with overall improvement in, in reimbursement. So I'm going to talk about, I guess, some of the more practical things we do in the clinic. A lot of this is based on errors I have made, I might have made, and somebody stopped me, or I will make in the future. And I can summarize the whole thing by this, this slide, actually. Um, and, and I think some of the practical things that happen in my clinic are we've designated a uh, skin substitute champion. Um, we've tried to pick our products wisely. Uh, we've tried to know about our coverage determinations and what our patient uh, responsibilities are financially. Um, we tried to do uh, great documentation, and somewhere my nurse practitioner is here who is the eye dotter, T-crosser, and make sure I don't mess up on the documentation, which I'm prone to. Um, we try to audit um, what's happened with our skin sub reimbursements, and in the future, I hope we'll keep on top of the changing landscape. So in terms of uh, trying to designate a responsible person, or we call it the skin substitute champion, um, we've designated a uh, about five foot zero, 90 pounds soaking wet, um, soft spoken nurse who carries a Glock. <laughs> and uh, she's very uh, she's very tough on me when I when I start to go out of bounds. Okay, and that's really important. And that person uh, is really well educated on the clinical aspects of skin substitutes. Some of the important parts in uh, reimbursement and 
confers with my billing company regularly on those reimbursement issues, and she's actually empowered um, to, uh, to Im give approval on procedures. Um, she is also uh, responsible for making sure we do a good job of documenting our approvals in a consistent way and what supportive documentation we have. So she's uh, a 90-pound uh, Glock-carrying uh, champion. So when you look at skin substitute, it's nearly not all about the finances because a good reputation, your good reputation, goes a long way in, in your business model. Um, so I don't want people to get um, lost in the weeds of well, I'm going to make an extra dollar with this, that, or the other thing. Pick what you think is going to work for the patient. But you've got to do a price value analysis to determine what your most effective product really is. Um, and you've got to make some limitations on your uh, products. You can't have everything in the armamentarium. And some limitations on the sizes that you'll stock. Um, that does several things. It reduces the opportunity for error, i.e. putting the wrong size, wrong place, wrong coating um, down. I would consider using widely recognized products because they're less likely to be deemed experimental when you go to get approval. But sometimes some of those newer and innovative products are worth taking the risk for. Keep up with your national and local uh, uh, coverage determinations. Know the private payers' determinations because they differ from the Medicare determinations. Understand those requirements for documentation and any other required information for reimbursement. And know how many applications you can put on consecutively and not be over the limit of your payer. Um, by the way, an, an error that I uh, uh, almost made <laughs> um, is documentation of skin substitutes. Some of my staff is responsible for scribing, and they'll put their name in the spot of who applied it. Well, they didn't apply it. They didn't even touch it, in fact. Um, but they get used to putting their name in places, and you've got to look carefully to make sure that a qualified person is actually given the credit for the application, i.e. nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or physician, all practicing within their scope of responsibility. So watch the EMR and make sure that you attribute things to the right person. Some of the often required information on skin subs, uh, how long has the wound been present, what are the prior treatments, have they had an adequate vascular evaluation, smoking cessation counseling, have their diabetes been controlled, have they been offloading for a foot ulcer, for example, or a pressure ulcer, have they been uh, having compression applied for a venous leg ulcer, and watch that you've documented how you've uh, prepared that wound bed. If you're documenting slough and you're putting a skin substitute on, you're going to get probably nabbed at some point for having put it on an inappropriate spot by a payer. Um, and that doesn't mean that you've got to repeatedly debride an area, but you should at least be able to document that you've taken care of wound bed preparation. And watch out that you use a product on a site and wound type that it's, that it's approved for. You can look at uh, Medicare's coverage database on cms.gov, um, lists all those things. And just because a Q code exists, um, they don't necessarily all have a uh, coverage determination. So you got to look. Um, and if you really don't have any guidance on whether something is going to be covered, then go to the individual insurer or the individual MAC um, and ask that question. And it's also not really a good idea to just accept a verbal okie dokie um, because they forget about their okie dokie a little later on. <laughs> um, most of the uh, major insurers have their policies available online. Uh, they change frequently, so you've got to keep looking. Um, products are covered based on the wound type, and like I said, policies often change and they don't necessarily follow the Medicare guidelines. Um, I would say that it is extremely important to get pre-authorization and in that get both uh, approval for uh, the product and its application. Uh, we've been surprised a couple of times by companies that have uh, insurer companies that have approved one and not the other. So we'll be glad to uh, let you put the product on, but we ain't paying for it. Or <laughs> we won't pay for your uh, putting it on. Document your authorization. Request a written confirmation if you can. Many of the manufacturers have approval departments and will back you up um, if you don't get paid, but they expect that you're going to do adequate documentation. It's not like a freebie, you don't have to document anymore and I'm not going to worry. Um, be careful of that phrase, pre-authorization is not required. 
And don't forget, the uh, patient is the one who has the contract with the insurance company. And they can be very effective in dealing with insurance plans that are going to refuse things, um, that are going to refuse products or refuse application. In that, also look at the financial responsibility of the patient. That really should be up front uh, discussion. Um, a lot of people think a written estimate of charges helps, and uh, some advise collecting payment up front on their financial co-pays. If there's a question about reimbursement, uh, getting an advanced benefit notification, um, especially with Medicare, is important if you wish to get paid for it. Sometimes patients will say, I'm going to pay for it. I know that product works. I want that product. I'll pay for it if, they, if the insurance company won't get something in writing from them. Because if you try and do it afterward, uh, an insurance company often will uh, keep you from collecting from that patient. And document, document, document. Um, Consider use of a template um, and the skin, skin subs champion carrying the Glock uh, can uh, use the documents to assist with pre-authorization. Know your codes and the modifiers and I would say in addition to the documentation of the procedure, track the receipt handling and storage, the pre-authorization process um, as well. And look at all your denials you get immediately. Don't wait until you place the fifth skin sub on somebody and have to work on five denials. Don't forget where you are. <laughs> um, you're in the hospital, you're in your office. Some people practice in both, so keep in mind what you're doing. Bill in real time, nothing worse than having a denial after you've put on number five. Um, make sure your CPT matches the procedure that you describe and the product code amount is correct. Um, and. Um, also in your documentation, I would use the appropriate description of why you're placing the product. Is it a device approved for healing? Is it a device approved for covering? When you go to repeat, you have to support that by documentation also, and it's not reasonable to reapply if the wound is epithelialized. <laughs> Some people have done that. Previous application was unsuccessful, and what does unsuccessful mean? Well, increase in size. Um, and no indication of improvement such as granulation, granulation or uh, epithelialization. So um, a repeat procedure is not appropriate if things aren't working. And we talked about wastage. There, uh, the high bucket and low bucket are uh, amply uh, also described on the CMS's website, um, so you can look at those. So. Um, know when your pass-through goes out. <laughs> and if the product size is unavailable, um, document why you use the product size. It seems inappropriate for that wound. We couldn't get a hold of the appropriate size product in a timely fashion, and this is necessary for the patient's care. Um, so last but not least, get a crystal ball. Um, <laughs> yeah, CMS has asked for a comment on several alternatives uh, for the payment system. They have had models that range from allowing payment of the current add-ons and additional, value, additional values that go between 26 and 99 square centimeters, so with that, that numbering system could expand exponentially, eliminating the high and low cost buckets with one payment category, establishing a, an episode-based payment system, or uh, keeping the high and low categories but changing the threshold that they use to assign to one or the other. So it's all changing. And basically, you've got to spend the time to look. Get yourself somebody with a Glock, and you'll have a security officer and a skin sub champion. <laughs> Would love to please take some questions. Don't be bashful. If you have the question, chances are excellent. Somebody else in the room does also. Please. Uh, you mentioned earlier well so that was what dr. Sammy's did at the end so in the 2019 OPPS and ASC proposed fee schedule CMS said we want to change this they figured out what I was talking about with the waste right and with the high bucket low bucket craziness it's not working for them we figured it out right smallest size that fits the ulcer that's high bucket or we're going crazy with pass-through which is staying for a while they want to change the game for OPPS or ASC. And they said, we want to change it January 1, 2020. This is not a rumor. This is not I heard or they might. It's happening. It's in writing. 
It's in the 2019 proposed rule. And they said, we are considering these four possibilities, and they solicited comment. So to their credit, if we're capable of giving them that, they did ask for comment, and big organizations and stakeholders, hopefully, were all over this and submitted comments. So these are the four. I can't resist. This lump sum episode-based payment, this is kind of like DRG, right? The idea here, this is not office, hospital, outpatient, ASC. Sorry, I'm totally stealing this, but I, I, I wanted to say this. This, this uh, episode-based model, it's a DRG concept, right? You put a skin sub on somebody, you get X dollars, there you go. Good luck. If you use two and you, you spend way less than X dollars, you win. If it takes forever and you get messed up and it drags on and you spend way, way, way more than X, you lose. And I, I'll share, I was really conflicted on this, so having to submit comments... We're supposed to advocate for our patients. We're also supposed to advocate for ourselves. And frankly, if it was my mom that was going to the doctor, I would want to know that the doctor was under the gun and super incentivized to do it the best way they can, as quickly as they can. But that's not maybe the best for us as the providers, right? Because we know our peeps. What happens if one of these people gets a product on, falls into the DRG model, and then they disappear for three weeks and put their foot in a swamp and don't wear their cast and don't fill their prescriptions and all that. Now, they're supposedly going to risk adjust, but that scares me. Do you guys have anything you want to add to that? Sorry. Well, Jeff, I think, I think you did a great job answering it. I, I think one thing that's important is documentation for wound sizes. Um, you know, we, we often have at our centers where one nurse will measure – and then the next week, the wound is actually smaller, but the measurement's not. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's, that goes along with the story that Jeff is saying. Is that I, I think it's incredibly important. So um, if you don't use, I, I think almost all wound care centers have a system now of documentation. I think it, it needs to be utilized. And li like he said, you have that, that reimbursement or, or, the, or the skin specialist. I, I think there needs to be a quality control nurse behind that as well, and could be the same person. What else, guys? That means we either did a really good job or a really bad job. All right, thanks for your attention. Enjoy the day.